Well, good morning. So today uh, I'm going. To, it's not working. Can you hear? No. I don't know. Now? Yes, better. <laughs> I, I, yes. I think it's working. It's working. Yes, yes. Um, okay, today I'm going to discuss the relation between the entanglement entropy and the renormalization group flow. Uh, the idea is to show you that it's possible to prove C theorems in terms of entanglement entropy, okay, in two, three, and four dimensions. Um, Okay, let's, uh, no, this is not, yes. Uh, let's start here, defining C theorems. The basic idea is that uh, uh, the renormalization group uh, gives you a systematic way uh, to study changes in the, in the physics when you change the energy scale or a distance scale. Perhaps the, the simplest way to, to think of this is if you put your system in a lattice and you want to, to see the changes in your, in your theory when you change the lattice space, for example, okay? And, um, okay, this uh, information at the end is encoded in the changes in, your, in the coupling constants uh, of your theory. These are, these are known as the beta functions. And then if you want to, to have a picture of the space of theories, perhaps the, the first step is to identify fixed points, okay, in this space of theories. Uh, in these fixed points, the theory looks the same at all scales. We say that these fixed points are scale invariants. Okay, and then the renormalization group flow interpolates between fixed, flow, uh, fixed points. Okay? Uh, but what is uh, interesting is that, in fact, in, in the flow, not all critical points can be joined okay, with uh, each other. There are constraints provided, uh, okay, by C theorems. So take this as a definition of what it is a C theorem. This is state that certain C charge decreases from the UV to the infrared fixed point, uh, showing the irreversible character of the RG flow, okay? So here I, I have listed three conditions this uh, C function has to satisfy in order to have a C theorem, okay? The, the first one says that uh, you need a quantity uh, which is uh, independent of the regularization you use, okay? This, we usually say a, a universal quantity. The second requirement is that C has to be dimensionless uh, and well-defined at the fixed points, finite at the fixed points. And the last condition is that C decreases along the renormalization group trajectories, okay? And, um, okay, now uh, let's, uh, let's see why uh, we can say that any universal dimensionless decreasing function C uh, will do the job, will satisfy the, the three conditions there. Uh, if, you, if you write the first condition as an equation, this is what you get. This is telling you that C is independent of uh, the regularization scheme you're using. Okay, the total derivative of C with respect to tau it uh, has to be zero. The second condition, C dimensionless, 
can be written in this way. And now if you combine these two equations, what you get is this. That it says that changes in C, uh, when you change this he here R, here is a characteristic length of your system, okay? For example, in the, in, in the case uh, of entanglement entropy for regions could be, I don't know, the length of your interval, okay, of the region. And uh, what it says, this region, is that changes in C, uh, the way C change when you change the length of the system is proportional to the change in C when you change the coupling constants, okay? So if you find uh, a quantity that is decreasing with the length of your system, you are done. You, you, you are sure you are, uh, you have these three conditions uh, fulfilled, okay? Um, so let's see how, yes? Say it again. The function here is, is the chain rule. I mean, you have the total derivative. You can write it in terms of these partial derivatives, but, uh, and this gives you. But the beta function. In general. The function. Yes, but the, the point is that here, what you have here is you prove that from condition one and two, the changes in C due to changes in, in the length, uh, characteristic length of your, of your system are equivalent to the changes in C, changes in the coupling constants. This is the only thing you need. I, I'm showing this because what we are going to, to show and, and also happens in the Samologic of proof, what he proves is that he finds a function C that is decreasing with a length, a characteristic length of the system. And then you can ask yourself, okay, why something that is decreasing with the, the characteristic length of my system uh, is decreasing along the renormalization group trajectory? And this is why, because C is dimensionless and is independent of the regularization scheme you're using. Okay, th this is the motivation for show you this this relation. Yes. Sorry. Tau. It should say tau here. It it's uh, I mean tau. It's uh, is is the yes is the scale the energy scale or the distance scale at. You're, you're viewing your, your system. Is the and R is the, the characteristic length of your system. So in general, of course, you are knowing, you, you, you cannot, you can, this, this is showing you that both things are related, okay? Uh, perhaps it's redundant, it's a redundant way of, of writing it. But this is just to show you that many times uh, people ask why if you have something which is decreasing with the length of your system, you have something that is decreasing uh, along the renormalization group trajectories. That, that's why I'm explicitly showing this, this relation, okay? So, uh, the first uh, C theorem that appeared in, in the literature was uh, due to Samologikov in 1986 for two dimensions. And uh, what he proved is that um, the C function at the fixed point for, uh, in two dimensions corresponds to the Virasoro central charge and he also uh, found uh, the C function in terms 
uh, of these two point correlators, this is the trace of the stress tensor. And uh, using reflection positivity, he showed this function is, uh, the derivative of this function is uh, negative, okay? Um, the idea is that, of course, this, the homologic of uh, C function at the fixed points, okay, takes, is, uh, is, is finite and, and is given uh, by the Virasoro central charge corresponding to the conformal field theory at the fixed point, okay? This, uh, in a way, okay, try again. Let's skip this, uh, again this, and uh, now let me, let me go to the entanglement entropy side and let's see if we can give a new proof or uh, an alternative proof of the same theorem but in terms of the entanglement entropy. Uh, for that, I, I, I will use these two properties of the entanglement entropy the first one uh, is, um, tells you that the, the entanglement entropy uh, given two sets, okay, with the same causal domain of dependence, you have the same entanglement entropy, okay? This is uh, easy to understand because what you are doing is tracing over the degrees of freedom that lives outside the region and, of course, um, the complementary region of A and A prime is the same as the global state is the same, of course you get exactly the, the same result, okay? This is uh, uh, way uh, due to causality, okay? And then we are going to use a strong subadditivity uh, that I, I have already mentioned yesterday or the day before, so these are the two basic in ingredients I'm going to use, okay? Let me, going back or forward? So, uh, let's see how, how the proof uh, can be done in, in terms of entanglement entropy. So the, the basic construction, you have to take two intervals which are boost to each other, okay, and you put the boundary on, on the light cone. And the idea is uh, to use the strong subadditivity to get some relevant constraints or information, okay, about, um, uh, about this quantity here. So if you see the, why I, I'm saying I, I'm using the independence uh, of the Cauchy surface because I can rewrite, these are the two, the two regions I'm considering. The entanglement entropy of this region here is equivalent to the entanglement entropy of X, Y. The entanglement entropy of B is equivalent to the entanglement entropy of Y and Z. Here we have the union and here we have the intersection, okay? And now, if you take the limit, this, this is big R and this is a small r, in the limit, okay, big R go into small r, what you get is this, uh, this equation here that has second derivatives of the entanglement entropy and first derivatives. From here, you can read this function C here, which has first derivative, negative first derivative. And uh, you say, okay, uh, so this C function, remember the, the requirements I have listed before, we need three things, okay? First, we need a, a dim dimensionless quantity, you need a regularization independent scheme quantity, and the third one, uh, you need something which is decreasing along the normalization group trajectories. And in fact, this C function defined like this satisfies the, the, the three requirements I mentioned before. 
months, okay? And yes. Yes. Well, here, here what, what we need is Lorentz invariance, and uh, we are using Lorentz invariance, and we are using uh, uh, well, we, you are assuming unitarity, but uh, Well, you need causality, I mean, to have this independence of the Cauchy surfaces. Uh, and, and you need uh, Lorentz invariance to express the entropy as a, a function of the length of uh, the interval, okay? Otherwise, it's not true. But um, These are the two things I'm using. I'm using Lorentz invariance and uh, causality. Well, I, I'm, I'm not using, in, 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 if you want, in, in the use of, uh, uh, of independence on the Cauchy surfaces, you, you you are implicitly saying that your theory is uh, unitary, but uh, causality, but uh, it's, it's not, that there's no step here where you need unitarity, okay? Yes. And, uh, okay, then uh, if you want to generalize, okay, let, let's, let's compare the, so now we have two C functions in two dimensions. We have the, the entropic C function and the Samolojic of C, C function. Both gives you, uh, uh, are equivalent in the sense Sorry. that, yes. This one? So easy. What? S of R. F? S. S. Ah, okay, S of R. Yes, the, the, I mean, you know the entanglement entropy depends on the length of your, R is just the length here, and R, big R here, the union, and small R is this length here. So the size of A is just the square root of the product of both. Okay, uh, so here you have the entropy twice the entropy, uh, the same, you are taking A and B have the same length, so you have twice this entropy here, and this is the, the union, well, this is the union, and this is the intersection, okay? And uh, the infinitesimal limit, you get, uh, you get this expression. For, for for big R close to small R, okay? And from here you can read this function satisfies uh, has negative derivative. So um, so far we have we have two uh, well something which is interesting is that this entropic uh, C function at the fixed point gives you, it's again proportional to the Virasoro central charge, since you know how to write the entropy at the conformal point. So this is the expression of the entropy at the conformal point. You, if you evaluate your C function uh, at the conformal point, what you get is something which is proportional to the Virasoro central charge as in the Samolojic of proof, okay? And uh, here it's uh, the way it looks, the, the C function for a Dirac, a real scalar, and a Majorana field. 
And then you can ask, once you have two, two different C functions, you can ask which is the difference, if uh, uh, is there a best one, are they related to each other, uh, if you can deduce one from the other one. And the answer is that the, the entropic C functions, in fact, are not related to the uh, somologic of C function. In, in what sense? Uh, the idea is, I mean, when we were trying to, to answer these questions, we didn't know that uh, Capelli, uh, Friedman, Frieden, and, and La Torre in 1991, uh, they, they already uh, answered the, the, these questions. They didn't know uh, about the, these entropic C functions, but what they, 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 they show in this uh, in this paper, is that in fact, once you have one C function, you have an infinite number of C functions that can be built in terms of this spectral density row here. Okay, and the, the, the way you can construct any C function is using, okay, a, a numerical function that satisfies these conditions. So any function, any C function, has, that has this form satisfies the three requirements I mentioned in the beginning. And, uh, okay, so, so you have a huge family of C functions in two dimensions. And you can say, okay, this entropic C function belongs to this family or not? And the answer is no, it's completely different because, and one way to, to deduce this is uh, you know the relation in an example. I mean, you can show this is not true because you know the relation between these um, spectral densities for a scalar and a direct field. And this relation implies that any C function which, is, which belongs to this family satisfies the relation here. So as this is, uh, negative, what you have is that the C function for a scalar has to be always above the C function for a Dirac field. And uh, for the somologic of C function, this is true. Uh, let me see, the, the first two curves corresponds to the somologic of C function and these two to the entropic C function. And uh, in one case, uh, okay, you have um, for a real scalar and for a direct field, which is the example I, I am giving you here. And uh, for the case of the somologic of C function, what you have is that this one here is uh, for a real scalar and this one is for a direct field. And the, in the case of the entropic C function, you have exactly the opposite. You, it appears first the Dirac for the Dirac field and, and, and then for a scalar. So you are sure that the entropic C function doesn't, belongs to the, doesn't belong to the same family, okay? So it's, it's, it's a different constraint, even if all, uh, both uh, at the fixed point looks the same, okay? It gives you the same, or are proportional at least, okay? So n nothing, it, this is just a comment, uh, because we were, for a long time, we were trying to relate both uh, C functions, and at the end we realized that it's not going to be possible, okay? Because our completely different constraints flow. So now let's, uh, let's go to three dimensions and uh, what we have learned in two dimensions is that uh, it's very useful to put the boundary of your regions on the, null, on the light null, on the null cone and, uh, and we also have a, a hint in three dimensions we knew we have to use circles. And uh, why? Because uh, from holographic C theorems, uh, 
from the F, the conjecture of F theorems, and also uh, there was uh, a proposal by Liu and Messey for a renormalized entanglement entropy, always considering circles, okay? The constant term of the entanglement entropy of a circle was the candidate proposed in three uh, previous papers. In, in fact, in, in this paper here is not, uh, is not the constant term of the entanglement entropy for a circle, but the free energy. But at the end, you can show this is exactly equivalent proposal of the, I mean, you, you can show that the free energy, it's to calculate the free energy, uh, it's equivalent to calculate the entanglement entropy for circles, okay? So we were sure the circles were the good candidates, and uh, we want also to use strong subadditivity because it works in two dimensions. We know the boundaries had to be put on the light cone, but the problem is that now uh, two sets uh, are not enough. And, uh, the, the, the reason I'm saying two sets is not enough because intersections of circles and unions of circles are not circles. So, and why you need the same kind of regions on both sides of the inequality? Because you need to cancel uh, divergent terms. Otherwise, the inequality is a trivial inequality, gives you no information, okay? So the solution we thought is that instead of taking two, we can take an infinite number of circles. This is the planar construction, okay? You take circles rotated an angle two pi k over n around a point, of course, different from the center, and uh, in, the, uh, in the infinite and limit, the sets you get looks like circles, okay, centered at the same point. So you say, okay, I can, I can use, uh, here I, I have written the, the strong subadditivity inequality for three sets, and uh, okay, you, it works in the sense that you have the, the same number of, uh, of regions uh, on both sides of the, of the inequality, but the problem is that in this planar construction, you see this wiggle region have, uh, has cusps, okay? And uh, we know that in three dimensions for circles, we don't have logarithmic contributions. Uh, so in this part, the left-hand side of the inequality, you don't have log contributions in the entropy, but you have log contributions to the entropy in the uh, right hand side of the inequality, okay? So it's not going to work because you have, you cannot cancel uh, the, the infinite on both sides of the, of the inequality. So the solution is to go to the light cone. Horrible. Okay. Uh, because as you approach the light cone, the angles okay, go to pi, and, the, and, and also the perimeters, even if at first sight you say, you, you believe that in the planar construction, this wiggle region has the, the same perimeter as a circle, is not true. And uh, okay, you can prove that if you put, uh, your construction on the light cone, the, the, li the limit, the infinite end limit is uh, enough to, I mean, to, in, 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 this, in this limit, the entropy of this wiggly region corresponds to the entropy of circles, okay? It, it has the good limit. And, uh, okay, this is, this is the expression you, you get uh, for once you take the, the infinite and limit, and again, you take the infinitesimal uh, limit, big R going to small r, 
and you get this inequality now. You, you, you get a restriction for the second derivative of the, of the entropy. This tells you the entropy is a concave function, okay? Uh, and again, from, from this inequality, you can read a C function, an interpolating function, with, uh, which is decreasing, okay, uh, with first derivative negative. And uh, as you know, the expression of the entropy at fixed points, uh, if you evaluate your interpolating function at the fixed point, what you get is exactly the, the constant term in the, in the entropy. But now in, in, okay, remember we have three requirements, so we have already a decreasing uh, a, a dimensionless and decreasing function, but uh, still you say, okay, this, this quantity at the fixed points is or not well defined. Uh, and the problem is that we know that the area term in the entanglement entropy is not universal. I mean, depends on the regularization you use. It, it, it's easy to see that if you change your definition of R in the lattice, for example, you can change the value of the constant term. And again, you can find a solution. No. Yes, you can find a solution uh, introducing the mutual information, which is a well-defined quantity in the quantum limit. And uh, the idea is that you can define uh, a kind of, uh, I don't know, you, you can use this mutual information as a geometric regulator for the entanglement entropy. The idea is that you take uh, these two regions and you take that in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, the mutual information is just twice the entanglement entropy of the circle, okay? Because, okay, the, the union is almost everything, so the, the entropy is zero, and uh, the entropy of A becomes equal to the entropy of B, okay? Here we are using that the, the entropy of the complementary region is equal to the, to the entropy of the region, if you start with a pure global state. So you have a way of de to define the entanglement entropy in terms of mutual information, and then you are safe saying that you have a good definition of the quantity as at the fixed points, okay? And, uh, okay, now you say, okay, you, you can go to higher dimensions, you can go to four dimensions, just taking now spheres, okay, boosted spheres and, and putting these spheres on the light cone. But let's, uh, let me tell you before which are the, the, the proposals done by, by other people. Uh, for higher dimensions, you have this, uh, um, the early result by Cardi in 1988. He proposed uh, the coefficient of the Euler density term in the trace anomaly at the fixed point as a candidate for a C-theorem, but just for even dimensions. In odd dimensions, you don't have such anomaly. Uh, okay, for odd dimensions, uh, you have these uh, holographic C theorems that tells you this, these are very general uh, because they have also a, a, not only the, a proposal for odd dimensions but also for even, for even dimensions. This uh, is the same as, the, as Cardi's proposal. 
but for all, the, all dimensions, what they say is the, is the constant term of the sphere entanglement entropy the good candidate for C theorems. And also we have the F uh, theorem propose finite term in the free energy okay, of a three sphere decreases between fixed points and the renormalization group flow. And uh, in fact, they show uh, that uh, in, in many cases that it works, uh, but uh, they didn't have the, the, the proof. So let's skip this part. And uh, okay, let's let's go to to four dimensions. Okay, if if you try the the, the natural generalization, as I said, is uh, to take symmetric configurations of boosted spheres in the limit of a large number of spheres. Okay, and uh, so you do exactly the same thing. You apply strong subadditivity, and what you get for any any dimensions is this expression here. This is the general expression you get using this construction, okay? And, uh, okay, in, in, in any dimension, the only problem is that uh, this is true only if you can replace the, the, the entropy of these wiggly spheres by spheres, okay? that uh, in three dimensions was true, but you have to prove that in any dimensions this is true also, okay? So this if, uh, in, in a way, uh, means that you have to answer these, these questions here, okay? It's, does the inequality contain cutoff independent information? Uh, this means divergent terms cancel between the two sides of the inequality. Uh, the second question is whether the wiggly sphere entropy can be related to sphere entropies. And the last is, okay, suppose everything goes okay and you can replace entropies of wiggly spheres by entropies of spheres. Still, uh, you have to make sure that uh, the inequality teach you something about central charges at, uh, at the fixed point, in the sense that if the inequality is strong enough uh, to reach, okay, the, the, the log coefficient in the entanglement mm -hmm. entropy. Since we know that the strong subadditivity at most gives you uh, second derivatives of the entanglement entropy. So, you uh, naively in, in four dimensions uh, use this inequality uh, and you evaluate for a fixed point, you know uh, the expression for the entanglement entropy. What you get is uh, that uh, the inequality is incorrect, okay? You, you get the wrong sign. So uh, evidently, uh, this replacement of entanglement entropy for wiggle spheres uh, by entropies of a sphere was incorrect. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to, to see if the angles in these, in four dimensions, gives you log contributions, okay? And, and uh, geometrically, you, you, can, you can answer this problem and, and the answer is that there's no log contributions coming from the angles in four dimensions. It's hard to prove it, but still you, you can do it. So the problem was not coming from the, the angles, but uh, the answer is, the, the, the problem is that the, these wiggle uh, spheres have, gives you a finite contribution that is not cancelled in the inequality. Um, so, the solution for this is uh, to use something called the Markov property of the, uh, we are going to, 
to use the Markov property of the vacuum state. And the statement is, is the following. The, the, um, the strong subadditivity for the vacuum state saturates when the boundary of your region lives uh, on the null plane, okay? This is, this is true for any quantum field theory, and in particular, if you have conformal symmetries, this is true also uh, in, the, in the light cone. So what you can do at no cost is to insert in your inequality uh, these zeros, okay? This uh, uh, relation, in, I mean, for the, for the, 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 en, the entanglement entropy, uh, the strong subadditivity when, when it's applied uh, in the UV uh, is Markovian, okay? And, and, and then it's, uh, you can introduce in, in your inequality uh, these zeros and, and in order to define these new quantities, so you are going to introduce this quantity that is just the, the, the entropy minus the entropy of the UB, okay? And uh, you can do it, you, ca you, can, you can replace without changing anything else uh, this, this quantity here in your inequality since the vacuum on the light cone is Markovian, okay? So you are inserting zeros in, in your inequality. And uh, the, the, the good news is that now these new quantities have the good limit in the infinite end limit. So the, the, this, this um, new quantities goes to from wiggly regions to spherical regions, okay? Have the good limit. Then you can replace uh, in your inequality here, it should say uh, S for wiggly regions, but you can write S for spheres, okay? And, and okay, this is, this is the solution of the problem, and what you get is this inequality here uh, that tells you that uh, the coefficient, the logarithmic coefficient in the infrared has to be smaller than the coefficient in the UV. So this is what we know as the A theorem. Uh, in, in general, uh, perhaps is uh, it's better to write uh, this um, general uh, expression here in terms of the entropy of the area, and this tells you simply that the second derivative is negative. So it tells you that uh, this new quantity that has the entropy, that has subtracted the entropy of the UV is a concave uh, function and uh, I mean, you, you can rewrite this expression in terms of the area and just gives you that the second derivative of this quantity is, uh, is negative, okay? Uh, so in, the, in this way, uh, you, you put if you want on the same footing the, 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 the three proof, okay, for two dimensions you get uh, the C function, in three dimensions you get the, the F theorem, in four dimensions you get the A theorem, okay? And the three of them can be treated in, in the same way. Just put in your your sets on the on the light cone and applying strong subadditivity. These are the ingredients you, we are using for proving the three theorems. Okay. Then you can ask if we can go to six or five dimensions, and the answer is 
No. <laughs> and, and the problem is that, okay, everything works okay, but uh, the strong subadditivity is not strong <laughs> enough. Uh, second derivatives of the entanglement entropy are not enough to reach the, the log coefficient. So it gives you an uh, area theorem if you want. You think that the, the second derivative of the entropy in terms of the area is concave, you have two restrictions, okay? I mean, the slopes of the, of the curve in the infrared uh, has to be uh, smaller than the slope of the curve in the UV, and you have also a restriction for the height of the tangent line at the infrared. It has to be positive. This means your curve is, is, uh, uh, is concave. And uh, these two restrictions are not enough. I mean, it tells you nothing about the logarithmic coefficient in more dimensions. So this is, we need or more inequalities or, or something is missing to go further. That's it. Questions? Yes. Okay, let's thank you. Okay.